this stuff is not, it's not fun, okay? But I love what I do because I get to deal with clients one-on-one. -on -one, right? I get to deal with families, with people who have babies, and it's, it's sort of probably one of the more positive interactions you could possibly have with an attorney, right? It's kind of short and sweet, and you check something off your list, and it tends to be that when I have like young family clients, there's a lot of things that they want to get done. They want to get things like life insurance in place. That's where Jay comes in. When we talk about estate plan, a lot of what we're talking about is sort of insuring your assets or insuring the inheritance. If, if, who, who, anyone married or think they'll be married someday? Raise your hands, right, okay. Uh, anyone have babies or think they'll have babies someday? Okay. I'm the parent of two young children that are 11 and seven. I can't believe it, they're on the cover there. I couldn't afford to pay a model. So, <laughs> so I use myself, I'm sorry. So when we talk about estate planning, what we're talking about is sort of making some blueprints, right? We're making some blueprints for bad things that will happen, right? So incapacity is first. If you're incapacitated, that means you can't make decisions for yourself, right? The primary thing you don't want is a court making that decision for you. If I'm suddenly, um, say an older person is incapacitated and they have three children, maybe they like certain ones more than others. They might want one of their children to make their health and financial decisions for them if they're incapacitated. Because we don't know when that's going to happen. I could walk out of here and get hit by a bus. Okay? We want to have some control. So there's health decisions, so there's my body, and there's the money decisions. If you're, for example, a partner in a practice, or you have business interests, you might want to have somebody different handling the business aspect versus your personal life. If you are, like, I wouldn't want my wife to handle my business in terms of my property if I'm incapacitated. Because she doesn't have the expertise to do it, and I wouldn't expect her to. But I might want her to be able to handle my 401k plan and pulling some money out of there, okay? So the, the base documents that everybody needs are what's kind of listed there in the brochure. But the first thing that people tend to gloss over is incapacity. Health decisions, end of life decisions. I'm not gonna tell a room full of doctors what a healthcare power of attorney and a living will is, okay? But you have to have those documents in place so they have a, a specific person to make those decisions. Pretty basic, right? The other thing is the general durable power of attorney. That's the financial document. You could also have a business power of attorney, as I mentioned. So again, if I have money and I have property that's just mine, I need somebody to step into my shoes and do all those things that I need to do. Everybody that's living, breathing, walking needs to have those documents in place. It does not matter how much money you make. It does not matter um, you know, how much money you have. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. We don't want to end up in what we call incapacity probate, which is where a judge, sitting in what's called the Orphan's Court in Pennsylvania, decides who your guardian is. And that guardian has to pay exorbitant amounts of money just to allow someone who supposedly cares about you to take your money out and use it for you. Right? Um, a lot of times I'll get phone calls from people, I think you know my grandmother has severe dementia and now we can't get into her retirement account. Well, what do we do? We need a power of attorney. Well, my first question is, is, does she have the capacity to sign a power of attorney? If she doesn't, because she has something like severe dementia, she can't even sign the document, and then we're sort of stuck. Right? And I'm going to ask that person for a very large retainer, whereas they could have done the estate planning for a lot less. This applies to you guys. It applies to your parents and your you know, siblings and, and anybody that you care about. Okay? Everybody in the world needs these things. Everybody loves to put it off and not deal with it. I understand. I don't bite talk to clients and talk about what they need and their basic documents. Most people, when they're starting out a family, for example, it's, you know, it doesn't need to be terribly difficult. It can be over, you know, in a couple months at the most, right? Probably less if you can make decisions, okay? So powers of attorney are the building blocks of any estate plan, dealing with incapacity. And if anybody has questions, please, you know, please let me know. I launched, I launched right into things. And because uh, I wanted to get more content, but just so you guys know before I go to the next thing, I'm a solo practitioner. I've been doing estate planning in my own practice for seven years now. I'm right downtown here. You know, I do things like I make house calls, I'll meet you where you are, I'll do evening appointments, all those things. Because I realized kind of the next topic, which is planning for when you have a family, you know, you're busy, right? You work a lot. I'll do evening and home appointments for people so they can get these things off their list, okay? Um, the next topic, though, with families is guardianship. So if you have kids like I do, you get to this point where you're like, I would really like to get away from these children and go on a vacation without my children. Okay? So like, like most people, I've done that. 
But the thought crosses your mind at that point, okay, what if I don't come back from that trip, right? Uh, I'm going to be on a plane, the plane crashes. It's obviously, it's extremely rare that parents orphan their children. But that doesn't mean we don't plan for it. It's unlikely that a term policy is going to pay out, right? Term life? Yeah. yeah. Extremely like, unlikely. That's why it's so cheap. You can get how much for how much? You can get $2 million for 2000 a year, whatever. Yeah, right? if you're 30 years old, you can get your, yourself a million dollars of 20-year term for, I don't know, four or 500 bucks a year. Right. It's, so they're just assessing risk, right? It's probably not going to pay out, but either you have it or you don't, and either you're going to need it or you're not going to need it, right? So the same thing kind of goes with a lot of estate planning things. Guardianship, okay, for children. That's the first thing that gets people motivated to do this, right? You have a baby, you have a list of things that you want to you want to click off. So guardianship. Who's going to be the guardian? Who are your kids going to physically go live with, right? Is it in another country? Is it in another state? So you want to think about... How is their life going to change? But the circle of people that you're going to be able to use is a lot of times pretty limited. You're not going to ask somebody you don't know well at work. You're going to ask a family member. Some people never ask family members, and they would only ask friends. But the amount of choices that you have and the way people react to that question is really, you know, as many types of people there are different choices on that. Some people would never use that sibling, and they would only use, you know, someone else, right? The other thing with guardianship is what actually happens when an accident occurs, right? So you don't want to think about this for very long. And I'm not going to, I'm going to force you to think about it, but then you can address it, right? If I have a car crash, if I'm in a, in a car with my wife and I'm without my children and my kids are at home with the grandparents, what happens the night of the accident when my wife and I are either injured slash killed in a car crash? What actually happens? Unfortunately, I've dealt with this, right? And the case that I dealt with, a young couple, uh, the husband was killed, he was the driver, the wife was severely injured, she died, she died later, okay? I know I'm a ray of sunshine, okay? <laughs> what happened the night of was the kids were at home with the grandmother. Department of Youth and Family Services in New Jersey, the social services agency, took custody of the children for a time, right? When people hear this that have children, they're absolutely shocked, and the only reason I bring it up is because you can address it. Every state allows parents to name temporary guardians for their children, right? Most people don't even know this. Most lawyers that even do estate planning don't even know that you can address this. So I have, for example, in my wallet, I have a card where I have emergency guardians named, right? So right here, if I collapse on the street on my way out of here, they're going to go in and I have an emergency medical card and then I have a guardianship card that has my wife's number on it and the, and the phone numbers of the temporary guardians for my children. If, I, if I'm fine and I show up, it's fine, it goes away, okay? So things like that are pretty simple to do. It addresses a very, you know, emotional type problem, and you can take care of it, right? So that's guardianship. Now, when we think about guardianship, we also want to think about if my kids do permanently have to go live with someone else and be raised by what I call the backup parents, who's in charge of the money, right? I commonly see physicians who are in the wealth building phase of their lives have very large life insurance policies, as they should, because they're trying to pay off debt. They're trying to replace years and years of income. Like when you're first starting out, you need a lot of money to fill a big gap to raise those kids or to care of your spouse. So sometimes I'll see two, four, six million dollar life insurance policies for physicians. That's a lot of money. It's not as much money as you think, and you got to make that money last. So what happens if my kids and they go live with that backup parent? We have to put that money in trust. Okay, what is a trust? It's really just a contract. It's a legal arrangement where I give the money sort of into a box, and the box holds the money. I create it. I'm called the grantor. The trustee is the fiduciary, the responsible person that has to care for that money, and they have to invest it, and they have to pay tax and, and do other things. And then the trustee needs to decide, what do my kids need for typically the words we use are health, education, maintenance, and support, which sort of means something to you when I say them. They mean something sort of slightly different because they're legal terms of art. But, you know, I put it this way. Nine out of ten trustees with good advice would agree this is the amount of money we need to maintain the lifestyle that my kids are used to, right? So that's what a trustee does and what's hard. The good news is, is you can use a trustee who's someone that you, is a family member or someone you care about. They don't have to know how to do it. They just have to know enough to know that they don't know how to do it. That's why there's lawyers like me. That's why there's financial planners, that's why there's accountants that can do all the things that they need to do to care for that money so that money lasts a long time. Costs of not doing that, I had a client coming in today uh, with her boyfriend, um, 
her English was not very good, and she told me that her, uh, her ex-boyfriend, who was the father of her 10-year-old child, had left many years ago and they hadn't had any contact. Well, he suddenly died, and the reason they knew that he died was because uh, a large life insurance company wrote a letter to the mother saying there's $400,000 of life insurance for your daughter, which is nice because he left the policy behind, you're right. But guess at what age that 10-year-old is going to access all that money? 18. 18. And guess what that money is going to be doing for the next eight years? Anybody know? Sitting in a savings account. Would you rather, would you rather $400,000 sit in a savings account or in the market? Market. Right. So if you have a trust, you can invest it. If you don't have a trust, you can't invest it because it's overseen by the court, and the court's going to say they need to be in something that's FDIC insured. So this young woman has to roughly $200,000 to do the deposit in two banks. Right? That's not doing a lot for her. Right? When she's 18, I don't know if she's going to take it to Vegas or invest it or what she's going to do. With money, okay? Not a way to do it. Right? Um, other things where I have a little bit of time, uh, and, then, and that's just when both parents die. Right? Now, obviously, it's more than likely that you, know, you live to a ripe old age, your children are adults, they inherit money, and those sort of young child issues are not a big deal. But there could be other, other issues for children, and you could even address them now. What if your children have predators? Or what if they have the, and that could include a divorcing spouse. What if you have two kids, one of them is being sued because they're an entrepreneur that didn't pay their bills, and what if one of them is divorcing? Is there are ways that you can leave the money to the children so that it's not subject to their creditors? Because usually what people want is they want the money to stay in the bloodline, right? They don't want it to go sideways to people that they don't know and they don't like. You surely do not like the person suing your child because when they're an adult, they're a bad landlord or they're a bad driver and they get sued and they don't have enough insurance, right? So you can do it just based on ages. As they get older, they get more money. You can never give them the lion's share of the money if you want to give it to the grandkids. You can protect them from their creditors. There's a lot of things that you can do. Uh, other thing to think about with estate planning is, especially if you're married, or really only if you're married, how does your spouse get the money? Most people don't think about this. Most people think, okay, I'm married, I love my spouse, maybe I have a prenup, maybe you don't. But if the marriage ends in death, I just want the money to go over to my spouse. That's what I call, I love you, honey, here's everything. I love you, honey, here's everything. It could be the life insurance goes over. The house is joint, it goes over. The retirement account is a beneficiary, it goes over. Right? If once they get that money, if you if they lose you and they're widowed, that money's theirs and they can do it, do what they want with it. Has anybody ever heard of a situation where somebody you know who's your age finds out that their stepmother or father has all the money and they thought they were gonna get something when their parent died? Right. Imagine your parent divorced and remarried, or you lost your mother and your father remarried. This is the Cinderella scenario, right? What if I die and I leave all my money to my wife and she, you know, obviously she can't live without me, she will lose her head, she makes a bad decision and remarries and she dies first, right? That's Cinderella, where she gets preyed upon, right? Most people, when they're elderly, if there's elder abuse, happens from somebody they know, right? Surprisingly, it's not just some random person off the street, it's someone they know. Or it could be their strife in the family with the kids. So one of the things you can do is you can say, I leave my money to my spouse in trust for their life, and there's a standard of living that they're able to, to live under from the money that comes out of there. And then it has to go to the kids. Right? So like my estate plan with my wife is I leave my primary, that's a lot of life insurance, I have big life insurance policies, leave it to my wife for her life. Her brother-in-law is her co-trustee, helps her manage it, make sure she spends it appropriately so she can't take round-the-world trips three times a year. Like if we took a vacation, she can still go on vacation. If she has a certain type of car, she can still have that type of car. If the roof on the house needs repair, she can still do that. If she has everyday living expenses, she can do that. But she can't, eh, I just feel like giving a quarter of the money to my friend or a charity or spend it wildly. If she gets remarried, she has to sign a prenuptial agreement for that new blended family to access the money. So these are the types of things that people don't really think about uh, in terms of, well, it's possible that my, my, my spouse is going to lose me and they're going to remarry or something's going to happen. Right? So that's kind of a deeper level of estate planning that people don't think about. Those are all the types of things that you can address. Kind of the last couple things I would think about would be just basic, basic personal finance. Okay. You have to understand what it is you own, how you own it, 
what happens if you're incapacitated, what happens if you die. If you have a bank account that's yours and you're incapacitated, you need a power of attorney. If you have a bank account that's joint with your spouse and you're incapacitated, the spouse can access it. If you have a retirement plan at work and you die, you have a beneficiary designated. Is it the right beneficiary? Right. That same IRA or 401k you have work, if you're incapacitated, you've got to have that power of attorney. You've got to have that person in there to access that money. Right? You have life insurance. We were just talking about the life insurance going to the 10-year-old girl. If you have a will and you didn't designate the trust under the will as the beneficiary, it's not going to go there. It's going to go right to the 10-year-old, right? So you have to go through every year and just look at the property that you have. Think about how much do I have? Uh, how do I own it? What's going to happen if I'm incapacitated? And what's going to happen to it when I die? And as long as you do that every year, like when you do your taxes, you're a huge part of the way there, especially if you have your trust in place and you can name that trust. But you can't name a trust that doesn't exist. That's one reason why I have to do a state plan. Okay. Anybody has any quick questions? Happy to take a quick one.